We originally were set him up last week to come on, Bruce Fine, former top counsel of the FCC. He's the lawyer that went to Reagan and Congress and got the fairness doctrine of not letting you have talk radio and, quote, be partisan. That, hey, I don't support Obamacare. Couldn't say that. Google's coming out now with their own fairness doctrine saying they'll decide what websites to be promoted and linked to. And Democratic Party groups connected to Soros are running in as usual. Bruce Fine, uh, again, is a best-selling author. He has a blog daily in the Washington Times uh, that you can find there. And he's going to cover the waterfront with us uh, here on that issue with, 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 with uh, currently with Israel, uh, his take on Russia, Ukraine, but mainly... The 300 plus pages that the FCC had won't release. He won't testify before Congress. I can't remember this type of arrogant uh, behavior. Bruce Fine's constitutional lawyer. He was Ron Paul's uh, domestic and foreign affairs advisor in his presidential campaigns. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to foreign affairs as well as domestic. So I appreciate Bruce Fine joining us. Bruce, uh, let's get into the situation with Israel first. What's your take? You heard my breakdown. Yes, I did. I, I think one of the first things the audience should remember that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu also testified for Congress in 2003 regarding uh, the invasion of Iraq. And at that time, he testified unequivocally that he knew uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, that he would use them. He also said that, in his view, the cure of Middle East ailments was to democratize the region. Uh, you know. Uh, as it's become undemocratized with Arab Spring. And, and anybody who could think you could take uh, political cultures that are pre-Magna Carta, pre-1215 in development and democratize them really needs their head examined. Uh, it would be like asking Netanyahu to solve the problem on the West Bank by democratizing Hamas, you know? Sure. It, it just isn't going to happen. And, of course, we followed uh, Netanyahu's advice and ended up spending three or four trillion dollars to make Iran stronger, the hegemon in the region. So why are we asking advice from someone who got it so wrong the first time? Aside from the recognition, I'm not blaming Prime Minister Netanyahu, his interests are been being reelected and in Israel, not the United States. So he obviously has a conflict with the U.S., so why are we paying so much attention to him? And by the way, the Israelis are saying that and even blocking out some of his speech if it's political. And uh, he doesn't have unified total support. I'm not attacking Netanyahu either. It's just that the right wing in this country, and we're more conservative, has this idea we do whatever Netanyahu says no matter what. Well, it, you know, it, it's just not our fight. No, you're, you're right. No, and if I can uh, divert for just a moment here, the joke said uh, years ago that Netanyahu was asked whether he wanted Israel to become the 51st state of the United States. He said, are you kidding? And lose 100 votes in the Senate? No, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but, but we need to remember, our interests are, are oftentimes aligned with Israel's, but not always. Uh, but our interests should trump Israel's interests. We have no interest in interfering or permitting our politics to be manipulated by Israel for their own domestic affairs. It just wins us enemies. Uh, and moreover, although I say we're often aligned with Israel, we shouldn't be uh, uh, subject to the baggage when Israel makes a decision we think is misconceived, and sometimes they do. After all, it was the Israelis who ultimately were the uh, supporters of Hamas to oppose at that time Yasser Arafat. Sure. So they can make mistakes. And we shouldn't be tied to their mistakes. Uh, I also think it's important, to, as you're pointing out, to remember, you know, deterrence. And there is, I think, this suggestion that we're dealing with uh, maniacs in Tehran who don't have a desire to survive, uh, and that unlike the Soviet Union or North Korea or Pakistan or others, uh, they can't be deterred, even though, as you point out, they would be incinerated if they ever used a nuclear weapon. They don't even have one, maybe capability at some time. You know, deterrence has worked. It worked in the Cuban Missile Crisis against a far more formidable adversary. Iran negotiated an end to the war with Iraq from 1980 to 88. Uh, when we shot down one of their passenger planes over the Persian Gulf, uh, they got reparations. They didn't attack and, and declare war against the United States. And they are, they exercise real politique like others, even if they're imbalanced. You know, even Adolf Hitler didn't use chemical weapons in World War II. They have, you know, a desire of self-preservation. Uh, I'm certainly in favor of threatening them with total incineration sure. if they ever used a weapon. What about uh, the Saudi Arabia wild card? We know Saudi Arabia is in there pushing for war with Iran more than Israel. 
Yeah, and again, for number one, I think the wild cards are a little less pronounced because the price of oil has plunged and we, we don't need so much Saudi oil. But uh, it is another example where we're being played by other countries to do their bidding. You know, the United States comes first. I mean, our citizens' interests come first. We pay the taxes, we obey the laws, we fight for the country. Uh, and we cannot permit, you know, Saudi Arabia to manipulate things. I mean, one thing I'd like Saudi Arabia to do is urge uh, the president and the Congress to release these 28 classified documents that suggest they may have been up to their elbows in 9-11 itself. And sure. here we have, more than 10 years after the 9-11 commission report, we don't even know what the, that, that connection is because of the secrecy. Uh, but Saudi Arabia, other countries there, all wanting us to get involved in their affairs, we say, you know, our country comes first. What do you think is really at the bottom of this? Because we know the U.S. and Israel were, were allied trying to overthrow Syria using really nasty people out of Saudi Arabia and other areas to do it. We now call them ISIS. They were called Al-Qaeda. Now we know we've sided with Iran to try to get control of that out-of-control group. I, I mean, I don't even know if there is cloak and dagger here. It just looks like a bunch of political wonks that have really screwed things up. Well, you're right, Alex. We oftentimes try to impute some kind of grand strategy or plan, but there isn't any. I mean, I work in government as well. It's all ad hoc based upon the next 24-hour news cycle. And it is, it's just it's just reacting, you know, for the next next day. But that And that is the problem. There isn't any ultimate strategy. There's no goal. Can you imagine a war? Take World War II. It, it was defined as the goal is to, was to degrade, to degrade, you know, the, the Luftwaffe. I mean, to fight the, the Japanese zero aircraft. That's not a strategy. That's just, we go fight to kill. But it has no political objective. There has no definition of, of what victory is. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why we should be out of this. We are in a position where if we didn't, you know, basically take a bayonet and smash a hornet's nest and create a lot of uh, very angry hornets, uh, we have the ability uh, to sit and ensure we are not attacked in the United States. And these other people who are half crazy and, and fanatical, they'll kill themselves. The Sunnis and Shias have been shooting at each other for a thousand years. Why should we get involved? And they're dispute. We don't wish misery on anybody else, but we got to be smart enough to know all we can do sure. is create anger towards ourselves and make ourselves less safe. And that is just stupid. Bruce Fine, the former head lawyer at the FCC who got rid of the Fairness Doctrine, we owe talk radio and so much of freedom of speech on the Internet to your initiative. And I know you don't like credit for it, but you, you are the guy that did that uh, uh, and a lot more. But but to, he all, you also assisted Bob Barr in drafting articles of impeachment against William Jefferson Clinton. I mean, you are a guy that gets stuff done. You've served in the bar uh, of the American Bar Association Task Force on presidential signing statements. I mean, I'm not going to go over everything you've done. You represented Edward Snowden's father over the Orwellian surveillance of American citizens. Yeah, I mean, you are a classical Americana do-gooder. Bruce Fine is our guest. We're going to break here in about a minute and a half. We're going to come back and get into free speech issues until 40 after when you leave us and, and look at this FCC power grab, in my view. But before we do that, putting a bookend on this, what do you expect out of Netanyahu's speech? What do you think it's really all about? Grandstanding to get reelected, or is he trying to sell uh, an Iran strike? Uh, he's trying, I think, to do both. Uh, I think he thinks the two converge, but we need to remember he's a politician. You know, it's, it's by definition he's trying to promote his reelection. But I do think that also he believes that his reelection chances are bolstered the more he can suggest he wants to uh, take out the, the nuclear equation in Iran, as was done years and years ago in the Osiric. In, uh, in Iraq. I, however, believe that his ultimate presentation will be largely a one or two day affair and it's piped here in the United States because it underscores the divergence between a Republican Congress and a Democratic White House. Uh, but I don't think the ramifications will endure more than 48 hours. I agree. I think they're using it as just another balkanization issue uh, to divide everybody, just like Soros has been caught funding the anti-police garbage. Also, after we talk about FCC issues that you're the prime man to talk about, I want to ask you about the Chicago Black site, because I know you're you're really uh, key on due process being key to everything. Bruce Fines, our guest. I'm Alex Jones. Gave birth to the rebirth of the First Amendment so we can have talk radio and change the ideas, because I've researched this, I'm not just saying this about our guest, about how the FCC should operate to promote the First Amendment, not degrade it.
But I'm being partisan here because it's a fact. Under Obama, we have seen an acceleration towards it to censor and control. We've heard senators say, use the FCC for a fairness doctrine. Take over cable. Take over movies. Take over print. When it's online, we need to protect the public from hate speech. But how better to fund it than for George Soros to give $196 million to bill it as net neutrality? Now, I haven't gotten Bruce's take on this current fiasco yet, but we'll find out. As best I can tell, sir, and you're the expert on this, this is a Trojan horse, and they won't release the 332 pages, and he won't testify to Congress. What is going on? Well, I think it's a usurpation, again, of the executive branch of the legislative authority of Congress. And think of this... Uh rather bizarre element to this net neutrality ruling. Uh, on the one hand, the commission, the three Democrats, conclude that, you know, the antitrust laws, the anti-monopoly laws aren't sufficient you know, to protect the public interest in efficient operations of the Internet. Now, on the other hand, they say that there's so little need for it, they're going to forbear from regulating prices and 90% and of what they could uh, regulate under Title II. That's called the Common Carrier Regulation. So they're basically just picking and choosing you know, what parts of the statute they want to enforce. You know, that's up to the, it's, it's an earmark of, of what Congress should be deciding. There's another element about a net neutrality that is equally bizarre. And that is typically, Alex, when you uh, buy a service, you can have various qualities of the provision, for instance, you can fly first class or business class or economy class. You get taken from A to B, uh, but the actual quality of the service varies, and you pay more if you receive higher quality. First class pays more than economy. And net neutrality is trying to say, well, you shouldn't permit people to buy first class tickets. I mean, really? That would seem bizarre to anybody who has taken a plane and, for whatever reason, needed the space, needed the rest or whatever to have a greater accommodation. And the whole purpose there behind this net neutrality is, you no. Know, some people, especially who are spectrum hogs, who use vastly more bandwidth, you know, shouldn't be uh, permitted to say, well, I am pay more and I need to get my, uh, my content uh, to the end user a little bit faster, uh, and I use up more space, and so I'll pay more. I mean, it's a, the anti-market uh, theory. You know, sure, it sounds like something we hear out of Venezuela and their ideas of uh, economics. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a, it's trying to it's a, a variation of God's plan, uh, the Soviet method of uh, distributing goods and services, where you have the government deciding, you know, how much and who should be paying what for what quality of uh, of internet connection. But is I mean, aren't we missing the really big issue here? And correct me if I'm wrong. Well, isn't this a power grab with the FCC saying that it's now over telecommunications completely, and, the, and that it's going to be over? Uh, future development of that architecture? I mean, that's a huge expansion of the jurisdiction. Well, certainly it's a, a, what I view as a usurpation. And although they claim that for the moment they won't use it to regulate prices uh, uh, in, in, in detail, they're claiming that they could if they wish to. And I want to step back for just a moment, Alex, and, and remind the audience that the antitrust laws, you know, they call them the the Magna Carta of Economic Liberties, they apply in telecommunications, the Internet, like they apply anyone else. So no one's talking about permitting price fixing or abuse of monopoly power. That's already illegal. And we have the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department to enforce them. So while we have the FCC coming back and saying, well, we know better than the Charter of Economic Liberties, you know, how the Internet should be run, especially ridiculous conclusion when it's the Internet that's, that's really the, the engine it's the 20 cylinders of our economy that's making things move. Why are you trying to mess up something that's working very, very well? And the answer is, it goes back to politics and say, disgruntlement uh, uh, with uh, the way the market system works, as most progressives and, and liberals are. They don't believe in free sure. choice. Why would the chairman not show up to Congress? That seems very belligerent. Well, not only that, in my view, Congress has the right not only to the chairman's uh, testimony, but to anybody else's. You know, it's an attempt probably to avoid what could be very uh, embarrassing questions.
Uh, Congress has the right to overrule by statute anything that uh, the FCC does. Uh, of course, the president could veto it, but that's a congressional prerogative. And, and to refuse to show up really is another example of how the executive branch has just become almost a one-branch tyranny. Let's come uh, back with that. The legislative branch has shrunk to, to almost uh, uh, a cipher. And, and I would be holding these people in contempt and finding them each day. Stay there, Bruce. Fine. One more segment. We're, We're on right the march. march. You're saying you would sanction people more and more. Uh, I mean, I've been following C-SPAN for 30 years. I've never seen behavior like I've seen uh, from the executive. And then the Republican leadership seems to roll over because they're licking their lips, I guess, to have all this power when they get a, a president in charge. So, again, I'm worried about an imperial presidency not even so much Obama, but I am shocked by the left that if Bush was trying something like this, you would have just heard howls. And and now they say, hey, you know, a lot of make Obama a dictator. He can give us some free stuff then. Uh, just incredible political ignorance. So so please finish up on that, uh, Mr. Yeah, Fine. It's, it's very, very important, um, uh, Alex, in, in a democratic country like ours, you know, that we have government in the sunshine. There are a few things that need to be secret location of truth, but relatively few. Transparency, sunshine is said to be the best disinfectant. So we have a right to know what our government is doing. How can we give consent to a government that's acting in secret? And so the whole idea that the, and, and, and when I was working as counsel on the Iran-Contra committee, this is uh, during Reagan uh, period. I mean, President Reagan was having Secretary of State George Shultz testify as National Security Advisor was testifying, Cap Weinberger was testifying, Secretary of Defense. It was all open in the sunshine. This is President Reagan. And now we have people like, you know, Chairman of the FCC, I don't want to answer questions. I don't want to show up. Well, the Congress should be telling you, one, if you don't show up, we will impeach and remove you from office because you have an obligation to explain to the American people what you're doing and why because you are there. Representative, you work for them, not for Obama. You work for we, the people who are sovereign. And if they are recalcitrant, they should impeach them or fine them 50,000, 100,000 every day that they don't appear. And you're right, it's stunning. Congress says, well, please tell us. You know, they wring their hands and do nothing. So they get, they get treated you know, like they're second and, and then third tier players. Because they simply won't stand up and defend their authorities. Now, maybe you're right. They're just waiting for the White House so that they can be the oppressors rather than the oppressed. But that's not uh, a very optimistic outlook for the future of the country. And I don't want to be oppressed by anybody in the White House. Exactly. A Democrat. Well, also, they, they promised to release the 332 pages as soon as they announced it. And then they haven't released it. And now have the Washington Post making fun of anybody that asked to see it when we know they printed it up in book form and they've been waving it around on TV for a month with this red tape around it. Uh, so I guess if they don't testify to Congress, why ever release it? They can be like the CIA. It'll just be secret. Yeah, I mean, and, and say, secret government is antithetical to anything like representative democracy. How can you have a government that doesn't even tell you what it's doing? After all, we get to decide to approve or disapprove. What's being done here? They don't get to issue by decree. You know, their elections and things can change. And there's this arrogance that's, that's totally antithetical to what our founding fathers thought, you know, a free and open government would be about. Other points, where do you expect this to go? The Hill, and I think rightly says, that this has to go through a gauntlet these rules and that that's why they're not releasing them. So I guess they think they want to win the propaganda war, that they're protecting the Internet before they roll this out by stealth. But that isn't working for Obamacare because as they roll it out, it becomes more unpopular by the day. So why are they engaging in this tactic? Well, they may be trying to bolster their defenses against what's sure to be a legal attack on the net neutrality rules. Uh, the Court of Appeals here, and the U.S. Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia, has, has rebuked the FCC on numerous occasions for overreach. <laughs> they may be worried that the shallowness of their explanations uh, need buttressing before there's going to be an immediate appeal. And perhaps uh, my expectation, Alex, would be uh, that there'll be a, a, a stay. Uh, of the FCC rules until there's a final court adjudication, which means there's years away, uh, given the legal frailty of their uh, promulgation.
What do you think is going to happen in your gut? I mean, the sense of Congress, the sense of the country, the sense of the other administrators and lawyers you talk to. Which way is this country going? Because it seems to be stampeding into an accelerated decline of the Roman Empire uh, meets Buck Rogers. In your gut, where do you think this country and the world's going, Bruce Fine? Well, you know, what we need is to restore our fundamental precepts as a country, which haven't changed in over 200 years. Human nature hasn't changed. You know, the, the empire uh, psychology hasn't changed. And we have, you know, I think, Alex, anywhere from 30, maybe 35 years to completely reorient ourselves as a country whose influence abroad is the influence of example. We need to restore separation of powers back home, transparency. We defend ourselves, but we don't go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, borrow 18, 19, 20 trillion dollars running around the world like Don Quixote, thinking that we can change cultures that are 1,000, 5,000 years old if ethnic you know, rivalries and, and, and despotism and the democracies. You can't do it. You know, if you could, you know, those people who believe that, Alex, I say, let them hire me build a perpetual motion machine. Sure. It's truly stunning. Failure after failure. Afghanistan fails. Yemen fails. Iraq fails. Syria fails. Nowhere. Libya fails. All of that. They keep coming back and doing the same thing. I mean, after I mean, Libya is a perfect example. You got 126 militias. The whole thing is is a Somalia-like desert land. And now we're going to visit the. You know, and remember, Libya and Yemen were viewed as the model that Obama singled out for pursuing ISIS. I mean, my God, the model. That's like saying, you know, General Custer's lab battle, the Little Bighorn, is the model by which we'll fight the future Indian wars. And you say, my God, are you crazy? And we need to just totally repudiate. This idea that we have some kind of obligation and expertise to cure all the ills in the world. Nice if it was possible, we will destroy ourselves as a consequence. Well, I think that's my view is Rand, if we can get Rand Paul and that philosophy back into the trajectory of where we're going as a country, we can save ourselves. Otherwise, we're following the path of the Roman Empire. It'll be just a matter of time. We'll bankrupt ourselves. We'll still overextend ourselves. We'll ultimately collapse. Well, I agree with you. And in closing, you notice that. Rand Paul won the CPAC poll, and he's nowhere in the news. And then they have a whisper campaign, the libertarian movement. Oh, he's not perfect. You know, he's not his dad, uh, so we better not support him. He's the best in the field. That's why the power structure is coming after him and ignoring him, folks. I want you to briefly comment on that because you got to go. And then also, yeah, yeah. have you heard about the London Guardian? Our reporters have been up there. There's a giant five-story and then a four-story and a three-story complex with black sites where people died, where people are kept for up to two days shackled and aren't even put in the arrest database in Chicago to then ring uh, these fake confessions. We, uh, they send police lieutenants and others from there to then run operations at torture camps uh, at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, uh, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Uh, ha have you heard about this black site? No, there have been cases in the past, year, you know, I think was one where people just disappeared into the jaws of the CIA and were, you were kidnapped and held for years uh, uh, illegally, uh, but I have not uh, fully apprised of what you've described there. I don't want to miss the opportunity to explain uh, Rand Paul. Sure, he clearly is going to be the one most attacked because he's challenging the military-industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned us about 50-some you know, years ago. Uh, so they'll be making up all sorts of things about Rand and trying to uh, obscure his popularity. Uh, and we need to remember, too, we're never going to get a candidate that is 100% everything we agree on. You know, no one's a clone of anybody else. He runs for office, and there are different demands than than being a philosopher and writing something perfect. And we shouldn't squander, you know, the, the, the good on the altar of the perfect. So this is ridiculous to suggest that Rand doesn't deserve our support, you know, because there's a few semicolons and trolley cues that we disagree with. Uh, on the fundamental issues of who we are as a nation and of liberty being the center of our constitutional universe, He's heads and shoulders above any other candidate in the last 20 years. Sure, nobody else is saying uh, end all the foreign aid. Nobody else is saying massively slash taxes. Nobody else is doing what he's doing. I mean, Ted Cruz is a 
a, a, a moderate second, but uh, I don't know Ted Cruzman. I know him. We've interviewed him, but uh, I don't know him like I've known Rand for 20 years. I know you've known the Pauls longer than that. He's the real deal. That's why they're coming after him. We need to support him. Bruce Fine, thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Okay. That is a champion of the First Amendment right there and a guy of action. Uh, Bruce Fine, very honored to have him on with BruceFineLaw.com.